Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome on the start of winter days. So we have a, a, a very intriguing session today. It's called Revisiting Supply Diversity and Renewed KPIs. Uh, as we all know, it's a post-COVID world. In the last conference that we held, and uh, we had some speakers from overseas, everybody's talking about China plus one, plus two, plus three. We are uh, interestingly moving away from the least cost to the most reliable supply lanes. And in the entire uh, world today, at boards, at supply chain heads, and I'm sure uh, all the people in the panel are very privy to that, uh, that kind of upheaval or change which is coming up and uh, sustainability index of a supply chain has become paramount rather than cost. So to debate this, I mean a fallout of this is that supply lines are changing, KPIs are changing the way any good supply chain manager or board looks at vendors, at KPIs, at photographies is, is completely different now. We have a very interesting and intriguing and uh, very august panel today. Uh, we have Mr. Muthu. He's Vice President of Supply Chain Management and Logistics at Daimler India. Uh, Mr. Muthu joined uh, Daimler India in 2009. He specializes in project management for heavy duty trucks. He's helped the trucks uh, truck launch for the Daimler India in 2012. In 25, Mr. Muthu moved to another Daimler entity, Mitsubishi Fuso Trucks and Bus Corporation Japan, where he oversaw product reliability warranty for Fuso trucks and buses globally. Prior to joining Daimler, Mr. Muthu worked with auto OEMs and tier one suppliers for Ford, India, Delphi, Vistion, et cetera. We also have uh, Mr. Sanjeev. He's Vice President, Gopal Global Supply Chain Management for Ford Motor Company. Sanjeev is Vice President of Global Supply Chain Management, Material Logistics and Exports in Ford Motor Company. He has 25 years of experience in supply chain management and logistics and material flow engineering. He's also worked in packing engineering, packaging engineering and purchasing in manufacturing, which gives him a deep insight into how suppliers and uh, vendors are managed in any manufacturing facility, not only from the supply chain side, but from the manufacturing side. He holds an engineering and PGDM in operations management degree. Uh, next we have uh, our old friend, Pramod Sant, Vice President and Head of Import and Export and Customs and at Siemens Limited. He's been a key contributor to CII conferences. Uh, he heads the import and exp import exports and customs for South Asia region that includes India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Maldives. He brings more than 30 years of experience in imports, exports, customs, foreign trade, and supply chain management. Procurement and logistics being his forte. He presently heads imports and export logistics for Siemens Limited and group companies and handles more than 45,000 shipments and top importers at Air Cargo. And they are also listed as top in importers of Air Cargo at uh, Mumbai Air Cargo Complex. Last year, Siemens was interestingly awarded the Authorized Economic Operator Tier 3 in India. And Siemens is the eighth company in India to achieve this status. And under this, his leadership, Siemens was also awarded Samman Patra, Certificate of Appreciation by Customs on International Customs Day in year 2016, 27, and 2020. So very much a hat trick, uh, Mr. Sun. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, Siemens is the only company to uh, receive this recognition from uh, Customs three times. And uh, I think we all know that uh, receiving that from a government authority in India holds maybe double the accreditation of receiving this from any, any other authority. 
And the last speaker on the panel and the most uh, diverse, my friend Manu Bhalla, Director and Global Head Contract Logistics and Supply Chain of Freight Systems. Manu has currently Director and Global Head of Contract Logistics and has over 25 years of experience across technology supply chain KPO, of which 19 years with FSL Group in different positions. He's a proven leader in cross-functional teams and business development specialist with entrepreneurial abilities and hands-on management style. He was part of the leadership team that grew India revenues from 60 crores in 1999 to 350 crores in 2009 before setting up supply chain division, which is called Logix, and has experience in all products and services of the company, ocean freight, air freight, logistics, supply chain, customs clearance, and NVOCC. And I'm sure we'll pick his brain more from the supply from the from the vendor side or the supply chain manager manage, manage, management associate side than the purchasing side. So uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for agreeing to give us your time and thoughts. And uh, now I'll invite Mr. Muthu to. I'll first invite Mr. Pramod Sant, who I think is the best person to answer the first question that has been on the agenda, on the note that has been given to me on this conference, which is what are the new evaluation parameters to assess for global suppliers? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anil, for this uh, question and really elaborate uh, introduction of all the panel members. I mean, it really adds the value with such all great experience into industry. And thanks for CIA for organizing this conference. So uh, Anil, you mentioned that it, start, it, it started with COVID. But if you look at the global scenario, it all started uh, in the earlier US president's area when there was a lot of uh, trade barriers, increase in duty with China and other things started. Also a lot of restriction coming from export control and other things. So the global scenario of supply chain was changing well before COVID. COVID added to that and it got accelerated. And uh, maybe it has also happened that in COVID, all the people are able to really think much more better way how to handle the supply chain. If you look at today, the importance given, if you uh, listen to CNBC in every day morning, uh, you will see that each CFO or a CEO is asked question. How is your supply chain? How you are tackling the issues of containers not availability, freight increases, how you are handling your last mile? What is the impact of all this on your uh, this thing? So the supply chain has got really great importance and I never seen each CEO or CFO knowing really the container situation, uh, really. So it gives the importance uh, back, which was definitely important, but it has been coming into public and uh, this area, the semiconductor shortage also added to that. Everybody knows that how many vehicles are pending now, which are tested, which we have to refit, we have to retest. And uh, so it's a really uh, critical time for supply chain, but it is a great opportunity for everybody to really look into what are we doing today and how you will do tomorrow. So just one statistic, if you look at the dependence on China, the world, the China is a single source for 30% of procurement. Uh, in, this is a world average. India is depending on 45% as a single source. Japan, who started really alternate source well before, a couple of years back, they are dependent on China for 50%. And these are the figures shows how vulnerable we are and how it is getting affected today. You also, the new parameter which come into diversity, Really, the uh, if you look at some particular area, you have some primary and secondary manufacturers. Again, uh, they are limited because of the connection. So you need to have diversity. Uh, what is also getting added is a customer demand. See, in all these critical situations, customer demand is influencing. Customer is expecting more and more, better products, faster delivery, and his own choice, which is adding to new things. So people are expecting that something you are making for me. So what it is making, it is it is making a uh, the product life cycle shorter. 
So when the product's life cycle is becoming shorter, you have an issue on inventory. Your inventories are increasing. At the same time, the new products, in order to meet the customer requirement, new products are becoming more complex. The products are doing multifunction. Products are requiring to do more, better, efficiently. So your product are becoming complex. And all this thing is adding, but at the same time, at least from the customer end, you are not getting the increased cost to that extent, definitely. Whereas your logistics costs are increasing everywhere. I mean, uh, everybody is really fully aware of how the container shortage, container prices, the shipping cost, the congestion at ports is affecting this. So all these things are the new parameters which needs to be considered. However, still I will add a few more points. As a supply chain, uh, one of the key parameters which come as a free trade agreement, that uh, how much you are sourcing from free trade agreement. If your procurement is 100% procurement out of 100% procurement, are your free trade agreement procurement is 5%, 10%, 20%, and how you are you going to tackle that? Number one, if you have based your procurement on free trade agreement and if there are changes or the new rules which government of India put and your suppliers are not able to adhere to that, uh, if they our government need more paperwork, more data, and if your vendor is not able to do, then you will lose free trade agreement benefit and your whole basis of selecting that source goes off. The, uh, the logistic supply chain is one more factor. How you are going to get this material? What kind of things are available to that? Today, we know a lot of material which uh, our principals in USA wants. Uh, it cannot flow directly from China to USA. We found that from China to India and India to USA is much better or a little cheaper also. Uh, is possible. So the new, how you are going to have a routing of your supply chain, what mode is one part definitely, but how you are going to route, uh, this thing is, uh, is going to be an issue. Also, uh, two more things which comes, and when you are having multi-source, you need to have traceability, which is very important. From where these products are coming, is a traceability criteria in your uh, evaluation, how you are going to trace the product, uh, people are tracing batches, but people need to trace individual parts also. So how it is going to do? Intellectual property uh, and the protection is one very criteria. Environment is another criteria. How environmental friendly are your uh, vendors and how is your supply chain uh, is environmental friendly is one of the new criteria which everybody is giving importance. Uh, now, other criteria is the non-tariff barriers in the supply country or origin country and the destination country is very important. Everywhere quality standards are being enforced and India is not exception. We have BIS, we have WPS, we have steel monitoring system, we have non-ferrous monitoring system, we have a chip monitoring system. So all these are non-tariff barriers and uh, you have to build in this cost also because every shipment you are, if steel parts, if it is coming uh, by sea, you are getting these certificates, it's adding to your cost. And uh, the, sometimes it could result into non-compliance. Sometimes it is going to delay your things, how we are handling uh, these costs. Uh, then the very new thing which is happening, the Ministry of Commerce is really active. They are pushing indigenization data. Uh, make in India is really important. We recently saw that uh, Ministry of Commerce came with a data of July to September import right from 2016 to 2020 averages for HS code wise. That means ministry is able to see that this HS code was average imported in July to September into 16 to 20 is so much. And they came out that July to September 21, there is an increase of 50%, 70%, 90%, 40%. So government digitization, artificial intelligence, and analysis is becoming really important. And this will lead to two ways. One, uh, how to increase in uh, supply base in India, or there could be some non-tariff barriers or tariff barriers coming on in this type of selection. So your global supply chain, particularly, this needs to be considered how you are going to tackle this issue, not only from global part, single source, but uh, how you will work on that. 
then the uh, one more finer point which i wanted to work we are talking about average lead time or turn around time but the this turn around time breakup needs to be really into a very small pieces uh, like your vendor you know vendor manufacturing time is x, x already available with you but however after manufacturing how much time he takes really from the date of invoice or the readiness or dispatch note onward to hand it over to your forwarder uh, how much forwarder takes time from receipt of invoice to the airway bill airway bill to airway uh, flight or the air, airway or to bill of lading to where vessel is getting and the cost associated with that uh, then really the transit time the transit time could be it will be uh, somewhere it is going to some hub or it is coming directly then whether it is taking time at hub or within india also it could be transshipped it may land up into delhi and then you will get it at bangalore or you will get it in bangalore and then you will get it to chennai or from bangalore you will get it to mumbai so how much time that is taking and what is the traceability in that so uh, these are the few with supplier but at the same time uh, at after at airport landing how is the segregation happening how is the ground handling agency capable how is a mial or a dial or bial is uh, supporting to uh, get the material on time and the how fast is the custom clearance and on carriage on carriage difficulties uh, and the last mile uh, needs to be looked into also uh, we talked about your supply chain safety and security is a very important when you are into global Uh, you need to have a secured supply chain safety uh, particularly if you are having some dangerous good lithium batteries etc or the products which are dangerous good or it requires x rays where your supply chain is a uh, partners are all authorized economic operator in this country or the origin country will also be helpful further and lastly how you you better utilize uh, the facilities like ftwz or man bonded manufacturing in customs in india uh, whether it is uh, helpful for you if you are you have to buy because of reasons of shortage or other thing excess inventory then can you keep it in ftwz and bring it to uh, your uh, factory or you can have a custom bonded warehouse in factory all these new evaluation parameters on global uh supply chain are critical uh, so i think this was my comments initially uh, about new evaluation pattern environment uh, safety uh, they are taking more importance clean energy how are your suppliers we have pressure that within city can you have a vendors who will only supply with electric uh, vehicles uh, what could be the possibility this is a pressure us on last mile that uh, if we are supplying to hospital can we have a uh, vehicles which are uh, clean energy vehicles or we are can we have electric vehicles so that we meet our commitment to the uh, clean energy so this type of pressures are coming uh, i think uh, all these ch challenges or a new kpi my feeling is that it will make a supply chain much more robust much more efficient much more green and uh, better yeah back to you anil Anil, we cannot hear you. Maybe we have an audio problem, Anil. Think <coughs> we can not hear him. no we still have issues if i may interject till uh, 
I mean, yeah, it's this very, audio. Very, I, uh, I mean, very um, excellent end-to-end uh, comprehensive outlook, Doctor Pramod. I think uh, you uh, you really uh, articulated pretty well the end-to-end scenario, uh, touching across the uh, supply chain, right from the source uh, to HS classification to the uh, challenges, digitization. Yeah, pretty much you have covered and made our job easier. For this session. Okay. Yeah. Adding to what uh, Sanjay said, uh, Mr. Pramod, I think um, um, uh, adding just one point, you know, adding to what you said, another one more thing which I feel uh, on this is also the ease of collaboration with suppliers, correct? Today, most of the manufacturers, or most of the customers, see, uh, we have to move from a transactional relationship to a more inclusive relationship. I think uh, that is also one of the key parameters which I feel which will help in the long run to build the bond between the partners and then make it more on top of whatever you said as a key parameters. Mutu, I think I didn't mention that because automobile is far ahead in collaborating with vendors. No, uh, it's not partners. So yeah. that goes without saying. I mean, yeah. automobile is a, no doubt a leading industry uh, which has made many milestones into quality, milestone into supply chain, just in time, you name the things. So I didn't mention all that, which is already not a mobile. <laughs> but still long way to go. I mean, you're right, yeah. it is there, but still long way to go because that is also focused and narrowed down to some set. No? If you want to expand Correct. that one. True. That's one Correct. Of Correct. Correct. And just to add a few things from my side. So part of this, you know, partnerships and new partnerships and, uh, you know, long-term relationships like Muthu sir, you're saying, a lot of it is technology driven also. So in the sense that, you know, you should have the connectivity with your partners and uh, so you get a real time visibility like Pramoji was saying visibility traceability right through the supply chain but uh, you see one of the challenges Mutu sir like you said there's still a long way to go because that trust factor is still being built you know there are many companies who well they have both sides that technology is ready but the connect is not there because of you know maybe some corporate guideline on firewall and you know that uh, you know sharing of data is a challenge so uh, there, there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, I'm glad that Pramoji spoke a little bit about the free zones, right? So one of the things, again, uh, you know, I think we are supposed to wait our turn, but since we are on the bandwagon, uh, see the regional distribution centers, those are going to be very big in the sense that Singapore was always very prominent. But recently I found Dubai is coming up as a very big distribution center for this region. In any case, you know, trade with uh, North and East Africa was a lot of it was rooted through uh, through Dubai and uh, including Pakistan also. Uh, but now I'm finding that it's becoming a, a great hub uh, for, you know, when you talk about air freight and we talk about free zone, I think Dubai actually wrote the book in terms of free zone, uh, free zones in the world, right? You know, in fact, China also, they, they started ramping up after seeing the success of the UAE, right? So, uh, so this, and because, you know, you have very strong carriers like Emirates and they're serving some 150 cities around the world in a day. So literally from, uh, if you have a distribution center in Dubai, you can reach anywhere in the world, you know, within 48 hours, right? And that when we talk about ease of doing business and now India is also sort of embracing that, you know, logistics performance index and so on, Dubai is, is absolutely fantastic. And uh, so a lot of our customers, both inbound and outbound, they are now seriously considering Dubai as a, as a logistics hub. And, uh, you know, the cost of operation is much lower than Singapore, right? And Singapore, you know, it's it geographically is located in one side of, you know, if you look at uh, the globe, right? But Dubai is pretty much in the center. So in terms of connectivity, in terms of, you know, uh, long haul, the costs are also quite favorable. So this is, uh, you know, something great. And uh, to answer your point, sir, free zone is great. But I think India has a way to, I mean, long way to go before we develop really seamless free zone operations. And the main thing in that is the transaction cost. Because you see, uh, when you are coming to uh, clearing shipment, then the transaction cost is very high. And when we say that the logistics cost in India is high, all these little, little things add up. And then you arrive at a total large number. So like you said, we have to break down, you know, the tax. We also have to break down the costs and see which ones are, you know, the good costs and which one are not the good costs. And then we need to do away with those. Yeah. Sorry, I think Anil is back with us. 
Yeah, I, I, I also think and I hope so. I've changed my yes, yes. Is it Over better? Your yes, yes, 100% better. Yeah. So uh, just uh, putting things back on track, I think Dr. Sant uh, very nicely spoke about 10 or 15, about 15 very key parameters that are used to evaluate, uh, you know, every supplier. Now, I just want to make the question a little more interesting. Uh, when you multiply these parameters by the number of suppliers or number of geographies that you deal with. And my question now is to Mr. Muthu, that what are the key challenges in managing the diverse supplier base? We know with every supplier, there are 10 or 15 challenges that Dr. Sant has highlighted. But if those challenges come from, let's say, you know, 10 different geographies, 30 different countries, what, what are the real challenges you have there? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Anil, and uh, thanks, Mr. Pramod, uh, for this one. I think you touched upon a couple of points uh, uh, when you started, where you said, uh, because of this recent COVID uh, supply chain uh, importance has uh, got attention globally and also across the uh, organization at the highest level. I think uh, it's a very good one. I would say it's a blessing in disguise. Uh, and as a supply chain uh, uh, executive, how are we going to use this opportunity to bring more visibility and more uh, this one? That's how I, I see this as a this as an opportunity. Now, getting into this uh, challenges, uh, I break these challenges in two aspects. You no, know? one is uh, from the manufacturer to the consumer, and second is from the uh, uh, suppliers you know, or the supply chain to the manufacturers. I'll be focusing on the the first second portion, which is from the uh, value chain uh, end to the manufacturer location. Um, so, in my view. Uh, knowing the end-to-end -end value chain, understanding the linkage uh, and predicting the risk is one of the key challenges. You know? With the diverse uh, uh, supply base that we have, uh, be it whatever industry, I, I, I talk about automotive, but I think the diversity and the complexity is common for any manufacturer when it comes to the value chain. You know? uh, one uh, uh, typical example, uh, which most of us have seen and uh, understood, but in reality, that example uh, helped us to really understand the complexity in it. No? We, we all came across these uh, semiconductor shortages uh, in the last quarter of uh, 2020, correct? When the demand and supply, there was a thing, it was a thing. Suddenly in uh, February, when there was a snowstorm in Texas, after weeks or so, we all were told that, oh, now there is another impact because the industry is not now. The first question we all, most of us asked, at least I was asking is, what does it mean to us? Why the snowstorm is having impact to us? Then we came to know, okay, the tire four or tire five of any semiconductor components, which is the basically the wafer ingots is being produced in Texas for all the global needs. Okay. So that's the first time, at least most of us come to know, okay, there is a linkage to it. Then of course we had a linkage of the South Asian Asian countries, which is, uh, uh, which is majorly contributing to this uh, wafers. And then we came to know about China, which is so basically it took some time for us in the industry to understand while we all know about a chip which is coming from China, where is the complete value chain? It starts from US to come of the Southeast Asia countries to make the wafers and from there to the China and there to the one of our tier one companies which makes the components or a PCB board. So basically the value chain is quite long, quite complex, quite diverse. And this is one of the biggest challenges uh, we came to know. So. Uh, like this, it's not only for semiconductor, it's also for other commodities. We also seen a, a challenges with respect to the uh, uh, plastic raw materials, you know, the, uh, this one. So it, it took some time, uh, I would say even not 100% clear now, to really understand what is the source, where it goes, and what the impact it could be. So uh, in my view, uh, establishing a clear end-to-end -end value chain till the source of the raw material is the biggest biggest uh, challenge, I would say, or an opportunity for us to get more things. You know? For example, as a manufacturer, normally we focus up to tire one to some extent up to tire two. But uh, with these examples, we should go up to tire n to understand where is the source of raw material coming and how it is going to be. Second, it also helped us to understand the lead time, correct? Uh, uh, Mr. Pramod, you also touched upon with a very, very valid point. Most of us are blindfolded with the lead time because we always chase to our immediate suppliers and then we were not having idea about what could be the lead time for a conversion from a raw material to a finished component that we get it. 
and uh, to be frank uh, most of us realize uh, uh, at least for the semiconductor we understood the lead time is going to be 30 weeks to 50 weeks that is also a new dimension which we learned it you no know, why these informations are not available so uh, these are the things which i would say create a value chain uh, uh, transparency understand the lead time understand the linkages the diverse linkages it happens and then create you know one example with uh, uh, mr pramod also touched upon is about the uh, uh, free trade so no so we also hear a lot of um, news a lot of uh, events happening around where there are some changes uh, between the uh, government policies um, and uh, impacts it can create to free trade now how fast we will be able to understand what that that impacts to us and then to react so i think with this uh, is very very important and why this is important is whatever we do today it is more of a react correct we are somehow managing it where the problem comes we try to react try to do everything to uh, uh, minimize the impact but are we doing something proactively uh, to a larger extent i would say no and be, and why because we lack uh, transparency we lack this information so without this doing a risk management and execution is impossible so of course we talk about a lot of risk management and things like that imagine uh, a new crisis which is coming uh, uh, next year uh, like a uh, like what we had the semiconductor something will we be better prepared in my view i would say no yes we are prepared in terms of how to handle but we are not prepared in terms of how to predict and how to see the impact so that's one of the biggest areas i see this one so creating end to end value chain uh, transparency includes lead time includes the diverse uh, 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 logistics path it takes and everything and then preparing ourselves for the risk management is what i would say as a big big challenge uh, from the raw metal to the consumer so over to you mr anil yeah uh, can you guys hear me now so do yeah mr anil yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so thank you, thank you, Mr. Mudu, for your uh, point of view here. Uh, I still have a follow-up question for uh, from what I could hear is if I can be a little more specific. Uh, how many geographies does uh, Daimler re re rely on from the, your your you know supplier-based portfolio today? So I I would say um, uh, almost all the. geography so we depend on uh, uh, north america south america all the southeast asian countries at least four to five southeast asian countries which is directly or indirectly linked to us and of course china and europe to a larger extent so i would say across the globe including uh, brazil and things like that okay. so and 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 that's, exactly, the... and that's exactly one of the reason when i talk about the impacts when we when we look at traditionally we say okay we have x number of suppliers from uh, uh, global sources which is located in abc locations but if you go beyond which which the current crisis help us to go beyond we realized the tier 2 tier 3 are sitting across no even for example we got to know that there is one supplier who is buying components from a location in tunisia i even never talked about that one so uh, that's exactly the reason no? so we need to go beyond tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 to understand and when we went into that details we have a full visibility of course even now we are going to see a little like we have this recent china power shortages we know there is a power shortages and we understood there are power uh, uh, the supplies uh, disrupted in different zones in china correct different provinces in china now we are going to the extent of saying which are the suppliers are present in that provinces which will have an impact to us so that if you ask me today we don't have it but that's exactly what we want to do so thank you thank you for that perspective and uh, uh, in our discussion then i'll i'll uh, think the follow up question that is going to come in a... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was thinking, in, uh, saying that interesting question will come up in the discussion is that uh, from uh, going beyond the tier one, going into his supplier base, and you know from where he's getting his materials, 
uh, you know, the question that comes to my mind is, is it before COVID also you went that deep or it's just, you know, post COVID when we realized that all the supply chains are breaking up that we decided to go that deep. But that's, that's think... for later discussion. Okay, later discussion. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my next question is uh, uh, to Mr. Sanjeev. And, uh, you know, this revolves around, like we've heard about all the complexities, all the challenges, and, you know, uh, even a company which is sitting in India, that global, global supply the base, how does India fit in into the global auto components market, particularly from an export point of view, the export of components? Okay. Um, so, uh, I would say India is still uh, quite attractive uh, in terms of uh, supporting the global auto component markets, uh, but it does come with some uh, few caveats, I would say. Um, it is gaining a competitive edge. Uh, I mean, we have a very good amalgamation of uh, global supplier base, uh, thanks to the global auto OEMs, I mean, be it in the north, south or west of India. Uh, you have access to or exposure and access to uh, more of uh, Japanese, German, US, Korean technology, right? So uh, that I can see that it has metamorphosed into a, uh, over the decade, I would say, uh, into a very good uh, uh, strengthening the foundation of a much enhanced uh, quality management system, uh, the kind of manufacturing processes and obviously the end-to-end -end, uh, logistics and the design for logistics strategies. So that has enabled and puts us in a, in a much better viewpoint. Um, uh, our uh, inherent uh, uh, transparency of, uh, I would say, accounting processes or costing, um, having an edge on the overall conversion costs, uh, the, the, the easily available availability of engineering and IT resources, right? And with the enhanced improvement of infrastructure, what we see, I mean, uh, even uh, I think they yesterday there was a Times Now Summit where uh, Mr. Nitin Gadkari was talking about uh, the fast evolution of uh, infrastructure, the integrated approach, what's the, uh, what, what the government is taking, right? It's just not one single ministry, this integrated uh, ministry is working together to ensure that, uh, be it on the smart cities, be it on the uh, uh, per day, the kilometers of road, what you lay out, so everything, the climate of uh, that political stability and the envisioning of uh, what you want to do for India, I think those are very great enablers at this point of time. Um, and certain things also helping us. I mean, in the beginning, uh, we were talking about uh, the China plus one quest, right? Or China plus one, two or three, whatever it is. So uh, we can see that uh, on various uh, kind of transparency issues and the uh, current hurdles, what we see uh, in, the, in, the, in the Chinese climate, uh, that is kind of giving us a better traction um, uh, for India as such as a market. And, uh, and those resourcing strategies says, why not India? Because uh, we have, as I said earlier, we have improved decade after decade in terms of beat on quality or in our engineering processes. Uh, the software strength, as I say, uh, earlier, we, we used to hear, hear a lot of digitization only in specific matured or, uh, 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 countries. Right now, we are talking about almost everything. We have democratized the uh, rapid prototyping, I would say, the simulation, the modeling, the reverse engineering uh, uh, skills, um, augmented realities. So we are able to, I mean, I would say from a port perspective, we are doing a lot of global work sitting here with all this uh, enhanced engineering tools, right? And we, we are clearly seeing those integration uh, with the uh, global OEMs with suppliers has enhanced uh, many of these uh, 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 digitalization and the automation kind of uh, uh, access and improved uh, outputs coming from the supplier. So those diversification and the various adaptation strategies, I would say, uh, is uh, definitely helping us. Um, and uh, I think a few of you have really talked about, right? The last one, Muthu talked about the end-to-end -end visibility I think the first, uh, uh, I think prior to pandemic, I still remember um, uh, the Japanese tsunami actually uh, gave us the first jolt, I would say, 
in terms of many um, um, electric and electronic components. So that's when the the the, the reality of how deep uh, the, the the actual connectivity of tier two, tier three, uh, which needs to be clearly monitored, came up. Um, not much was done, probably, but over a period, uh, uh, it did and get enhanced. But uh, uh, pandemic really shook the world. So the 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 efforts of giving the entire responsibility on a tier one supplier as as now that mindset is changing where you need to really get into the down the the levels of tier two tier three to ensure that how well because if india has to really uh, uh, be seen as a good export it has all its competitive advantages but if you really see there are as i said the caveats in terms of um, how well the tier ones manage their establish their end to end supply chain um, that that tells a tale because there are horror stories where uh, earlier uh, suppliers who have been uh, uh, full time exports to north america or, or to europe uh, be it labor or be it uh, their uh, delinquent uh, uh, tier two or three suppliers have actually uh, uh, kind of cast some shadow in terms of whether india is actually having a very robust and resilient supply chain so but i clearly see uh, uh, all these efforts of uh, technology, the adaptation strategies, I think we need to further move on because the, the disruption into EV, right, the, 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 the sourcing patterns and the sorting footprint can change. How you evolve your raw material, again, Muthu was mentioning about uh, your wafers, then it gets, getting into Southeast, then get, getting back to North America. The, the, the complexities of supply chain is, is a bit dynamic, right? So how, how does uh, uh, the, 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 the auto component industry uh, really manage uh, that complexity by dwelling into those network. Uh, uh, it, it is a combination. I mean, if you're just going to go by a low cost and and I think uh, uh, Dr. Anil, I think you mentioned that, right? From a least cost to a reliability, right? So, so that has been um, uh, a key parameter because it's just not on the sourcing or a low cost, but it is the end to end in terms of uh, how your landed cost works. Uh, uh, inventory is not a bad thing. Uh, you do uh, require inventory uh, with all this post pandemic, what we have seen. So it is the, the, the uh, scenario where every work stream in terms of the opportunities for exports or how a global auto uh, industry is being seen from India. I think it, 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 it does uh, lay out a lot of things. There are many uh, um, Western OEMs who would want uh, 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 associated RDCs or they wanted uh, at their end or it is at the source and how you manage that. So it is uh, that the network of opportunities, be it for logistics, be it for tier one, tier two, is, is, uh, is growing uh, pretty well. The key thing is how the government and the public-private partnership, how that also evolves is another key underlying factor. But the short answer is yes, um, things are uh, pretty much the outlook, I would say from my point of view is pretty much good. The, the, kind, the right kind of ingredients in terms of technology, people, resource, engineering skills um, uh, is developing. And I think I, I only see that we can only move forward and take the best um, opportunity uh, in this pandemic times. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a follow-up question, small one. How are we doing on the soft uh, issue, which is often, uh, you know, with China was under the carpet of IPRs in terms of, you know, component industry IPRs. Are we living up to global expectations there? I, from what I have gone through uh, the public material, I haven't seen scenarios where um, uh, Indian from Indian suppliers, you have such IPR uh, conflicts coming in. Uh, as I said in the start, our accounting practices and the transparency of our costing methodologies have, have kind of uh, been taken note by a lot of uh, Western or the North American uh, OEMs. I guess these should actually enable us to, to uh, uh, cement our uh, a long-standing trust amongst the global players. So now uh, we uh, come to you, Manu, because you're the one man who's supposed to get it there, right? 
so you have to live with the diversity you have to live with the with the, with the various caveats of customs clearances your people have to know every detail about every geography because end of the day it's it's i won't say your neck on the line but it's it's the it's the supply chain partner's job to get it done right and of course everybody works towards the same goal your clients give you a complete brief but still there is you know uh, with every country there is an unknown at least one and with the developing countries many unknowns so how do you see this you know supplier base supply lines changing and the challenges they bring out and what what do you see the model shift are, are we doing more air are we doing more shift you know how how's it how's it going okay thanks uh, thanks anil and thanks everybody i think uh, everybody gave some very interesting perspectives and i think we covered a lot of stuff that we wanted to do so uh, yeah first i will i will answer anil's question and then uh, some of the other you know addendums so uh, anil yeah there's a lot of shift uh, you know that we talked about china plus one uh, in a easy way we are saying near shoring near shoring is 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 something that's that's happening across the world not only in india in all countries uh, including you know uh, some of the european countries so the you know the manufacturing production centers in us also they also look at near shoring so uh, uh, like uh, i think pramod ji said you know the people are depending between 30 40 50 percent on china but that has to change and it has to change quickly and and uh, it's very important that you know the supply chain partners that you select uh, should be those who are uh, you know having that capability and the bandwidth and of course the network to kind of serve in the various geographies right and also uh, so there are two two i mean actually one word i learned during this covid prior to covid you know the mantra everybody was talking about is buka and how to address the buka challenges right right but uh, i learned a new word and that was a combination of uh, of uh, you know ambiguity and agility called ambiguity right so what it what it is that we are in an ambiguous situation but it you know how agile we are you know in in the supply chain world or whatever we do how agile we are to come out of that ambiguity and address new challenges which have not been faced before so that is going to determine how we succeed in our uh, you know supply chain uh, in pretty much anything but you know supply chain is is actually becoming more and more important and uh, and so the trade flows uh one of the international trade flows and you know before uh, i was mentioning that the regional distribution centers are going to play a major role and then uh, it will depend on you know the 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 connectivity from the regional uh, uh, locations and of course the pricing because i mean the freight costs we all know where it's gone we used to move containers at 3 and 1/2 thousand dollars it went up to 14 15000 20000 $20, and you couldn't get space so it's uh, you know it's a it's a very different uh, situation i mean nobody can plan for this you know 10x sort of changes right so that's how how uh, agile you are to respond now just to take a few examples when uh, somebody mentioned import uh, to us via india was cheaper and yes we've been doing that so there, there are opportunities where we actually bring in cargo in, into india there is some value add going goes off from the us so and apart from that we were finding dubai again uh, availability of space so one is the price another space to the carriers because of so many blank sailings and we know what's going on so uh, we were able to secure for some of our customers ex dubai so when we are talking about you know uh, changing trade flows these are not planned if there's a ship to us everybody is to first ask for a direct sailing now they are saying you give me a direct sailing but also tell me you got space so what will i do with the direct sailing so what we found is that cargo is lying in india for some time two week three weeks they are missing two three sailings so what we did is we moved the cargo to dubai and you know there there are a lot of uh, uh, sailings to to dubai and so that the transit time was overall less or equal to what was happening from india on a direct sailing and even the cost saving was there because the pricing was you know more competitive via dubai than direct sailings of course that's changed because you know even the shipping lines are very agile now they realize that okay buddy, this is what's happening a lot of trade flows moving by dubai 
So they put a GRI, you know, in X to buy. So these are, I mean, these are dynamic changes, right? And and uh, and uh, you know, we have to be thinking on our feet all the time. And like Mutusa said, you know, we cannot be reactive. We also have to be proactive. We've got to think what's next, and we've got to think ahead. And uh, and uh, what Sanjeevji said, you know, talked about infrastructure. So. Uh, infrastructure is a pet subject of mine, of, <laughs> as Anil knows in India. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a real Indian enthusiast. And Sanjeev, sir, thank you for the affirmation that India can be a great, I won't say alternative, but uh, an additional, a plus one partner for, you know, many of the global giants. And to that end, uh, like you said, the integrated logistics policy that the Indian government is coming up, it's touching on every aspect that we spoke about today. Whether it is the infrastructure by way of multimodal parks, whether it is by the technology, whether it is the coordination by various departments like Sanjeev with the Gati Shakti, uh, you know, initiative by the Prime Minister's office. So these are all steps in the right direction. And uh, like we all said, you know, suddenly supply chain has become a very, very important uh, subject right from, you know, the leadership. You talk about vaccine. So vaccine was everything about supply chain and distribution, right? So this is a very exciting time. And, uh, and uh, you know, one of the other things is that the multimodal en envisage is not only, you know, uh, the existing infrastructure, but changes. So, for example, today around 60% of the freight in India is moving by road. But there is a roadmap now for railways, multimodal, uh, inland waterways. So all these things are part of the grand plan. The question is, how quickly can we implement it and how efficiently and effectively we can, you know, uh, uh, gear up to meet international uh, requirements in terms of, you know, not only quality and other things, but the timeliness and the time to market, right? So, uh, I mean, that's a few things from my side, Anil, back to you, and, you know, we can continue on, on the discussion. So uh, I, 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 I mean, I keep rolling back to one of the very interesting observations by Dr. Pramod Sun, which was that the government now has data, the complete data visibility for last maybe five or six years as to exactly how much component is being imported from which geography and, you know, break down to a very granular level is available. And... Uh, we are very smart and astute people, so is the government in India. And, you know, we can see uh, some kind of non-direct barriers going in the future, going up in the future. Uh, the question that, that, that comes to my mind, and, you know, any gentleman from the forum can answer that, is that how will India use this data? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Your question back to you. Yeah. So I will tell you two things, which is also we have not considered in the for initial talk. One is a skill set or the requirement of a trained manpower into supply chain, number one. And the second is the digitization, uh, which is there. So I will just give an example uh, of uh, every year I have a team of people coming from CI Institute of Logistics doing projects with me and they do the projects over a period of batches and uh, this batch we have found that the team is so highly data oriented and trying to use that we gave them some rough data and uh, even though we didn't mention clarify each header and they could drill down into try to understand find out somewhere and instead of one project we did a six projects to data analyzing and then they you could use a tool like power bi uh, and other things to arrive and give me a destination wise uh, dashboards uh, which could really help me into which origin which forwarder which cha which port what time which indicators etc so what we need to do is number one uh, we, within our team so for example my in my team i have a person who is uh, uh, coming from a strategy background uh, because we always deal with day-to-day uh, -day issues and we try to, I mean, we could not spend time into the more strategic issue. So the person who is looking for our everyday action into some strategic view and try to work on digitization on data and the analysis part 
is going to be really helpful for us to take the next steps. We, we will have an experience, we will know, we will know, but uh, many things. But uh, this to put into this strategy by analyzing data and that type of skill sets you will require into more and more. I don't say that today you don't, we don't have that. We have that today, but it is changing very fast. We will need such uh, skilled manpower digitization with this uh, analytical mind and strategic mind into supply chain. Yeah. Uh, can I also add, Anil, so one of the things uh, also I want to say is that now we know which are the, you know, uh, let's say the items, components that are coming. I think there's a great opportunity for indigenization. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the international majors, uh, they must be exploring what are the new components or the additional components that we can do the indigenization program, right? So uh, I'm sure with, when you're doing your critical studies and the data analytics, you will know that obviously how to secure your supply chain. So which are those critical components? One of course is that you will hold a longer inventory, especially for the long lead uh, products. But uh, if there is an opportunity for indigenization, I'm sure that you, your teams will also be exploring indigenization of some additional components. So that's a huge opportunity, not only for automotive, but even for you know, things like defense and, and uh, air, air, air in, aircraft industry and so on. I think all the majors are doing it which again dovetails into the made in India and the manufacture in India opportunity. And to do all of these things, we have to sort of orchestrate every element, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, the government policy, like Sanjeev sir said, whether it's the infrastructure like is being addressed by, you know, uh, and then of course, the skilled people to execute the plan and up to that quality. And of course, the timeliness and the overall cost you know, the, the cost, which is the landed cost today, you know, earlier it was just port to port freight, but today it's the landed cost and that includes every element of that uh, product, you know, even the hidden elements. So over to you, sir. I think Matusa wants to say something. Yes. So I think uh, you brought the right point, no? Uh, how to use this data, Mr. Manu, you mentioned, no? Localization. Typically, as a individual manufacturers, what we do is we try to look at the components that we import and see, does it make a business case to localize it, correct? Some, most of the time, we end up in a negative business case and we drop that idea. But if we have this data consolidated and we can understand uh, certain commodities, which as a large buy across industries, and that gives a big advantage for us to localize exactly what you mentioned. Now, normally, we, uh, if you take one commodity, like for example, motors, uh, small motors and all, uh, mostly it comes from China as a final component. But I think some more analysis of this data breaking into the next level to understand why this is important. And uh, is it something that can add value as an overall aspects for Indian consumers or Indian manufacturers? I think that would be a really good. So if this data is available as uh, uh, mentioned, I think that I think the best would be to further deep dive and see which commodity makes sense to uh, make it local. Um, adding to another point, uh, which um, uh, Sanjeev also touched upon with respect to how attractive is Indian uh, global auto components markets. I think for sure, over the last 10 years, 15 years, if you see a lot of uh, Europeans and uh, uh, North American, even Japanese uh, uh, manufacturers are resourcing a lot from India. There's no doubt about this one. I, I see this in two aspects. One is in the overall uh, logistics. Uh, I think, Mr. Manu, you touched upon the initiatives by the government, which will reduce the logistics cost and ease. I think, uh, I think uh, historically, the logistics cost, when compared uh, to India, to compare other worlds, we are a bit higher. I think our logistics costs yeah. are around uh, four five percent higher. I think with these measures, it should come down. I think that brings a big advantage in terms of the cost. The second point is the quality is good, design is good. But overall, the perception, how we are going to change the perception amongst the outside people that what is in quality. You know? When we talk about a, a component or a system from Germany, we all remember it's the best engineered. When we talk about a, a, a component from uh, Japan, we say this is best quality. Anybody in India will tell this one. When we think about a component from uh, China, I'm not talking about automotive component, anything. No? The general perception is it's not the right quality. In fact, it is wrong. We also have high quality products from China, but that's a perception. Unfortunately, that's how it is built over. But when you talk about a component from India, the perception is low cost. While it is true, 
but the next understanding is it's not a high quality correct so uh, one thing that i feel personally is that we should create an usp for components from india any exports from india and what is the usp that we wanted the rest of the world to understand definitely yes it's not a low cost it's a best cost i would say it's not a low cost it's a best cost but beyond that what is the usp that we should create for the rest of the world that when it comes to india i think that's one dream i have people outside india okay this is coming from india this is known for this one today it's not there uh, while we thought about that that's uh, some point from my side sir if i can just respond a little bit i wanted to add we are you know we've see, we've seen the jab you talked to the japanese companies and i think we all learned something right from tqm and all that you know from the old uh the toyota management systems but one of the really important things is when we talk about partnership between the vendor and the principal we have to learn from the japanese because they invest in the partner and they believe that their success lies in the success of their vendor right so they will do everything that they can to ensure that he is successful right and many company uh, companies without mentioning name or uh, countries also they do not go that extra mile which is why if you see a japanese vendor he'll be with that company 10 years 20 years 30 years unless there is something seriously when he says uh, sir i cannot do this right then they will look for alternative vendor right but so this is uh, again my humble suggestion we've got two giants before us i would say sir that uh, to really make this happen it is a joint dream between uh, the oem that is the user and the vendor whether it's tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 we have to really partner them and show them the way because uh, see if they are having uh, we are still a developing nation or we are just getting there to a developed state but uh, there are lot of learnings that we still have to do to to come to the international standards in terms of quality effectiveness you know. so there you know if we can have a hand, holding hand from from let's say the oem and who will will you know take the partnership further in a in a way that we have to succeed together that's just my submission sir i think uh, 100% right i think that's exactly what i also mentioned as one of the key parameters for us should be the collaboration with the partners correct i think that's definitely yes. one of the key parameters that's the point. Yes. because unless you are having a strong collaboration you're not it's it's move as i said it's said to move from a transactional to a more inclusive environment right. uh, you have to do today we are not there yet and and one more one more comment from my side to what mr pramod mentioned about the skill set and training i think that's that's very uh, very very vital for us and also here also we need to uh, uh, slightly um, uh, improve on or change on our methodology because um, uh, one thing that we have seen over a period of time is while we have lot of uh, induced lot of training something one thing we are uh, still having a gap is how consistent we are correct uh, when it comes to monotonous job no so in terms of following a standards properly i think that's one of the things which we need to start inducing from our school education so that in future we are prepared for that that's the comment from my side so what what's very interesting is that uh, in the entire discussion so far cost has been one of the parameters not the only parameters and if we go to any forum pre corona cost would have been the first parameter to be discussed so i am i am i'm really happy that you know things have moved on and what uh, mr muthu just said that having been through the last two years everybody now realizes the value that a partnership becomes vis a vis a transactional relationship with the vendor so i i i only see positives going forward and one of the questions which is you know uh, i can see on the chat from uh, one of the uh, audience would all was also relating to the same thing that you know uh, uh, how well can india benefit from this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, from this gap or or this valley that has been created by last two years and uh, i think uh, from what i hear on the dais today and uh, you know uh, manu uh, I, i you mentioned near shoring i i i'm i'm sorry but uh, you know it doesn't mean very well for your international re- revenues but it it is it is a very uh, very very big uh, you know i'll not say elephant but it's a tiger in our face now and if you see how 
the manufacturing sector is moving in India. And I'm talking about tier three, tier four, you know, this, the standard manufacturing sector, the component manufacturing sector. I think they're, 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 they're rising up to the challenge and, you know, they will go up and beyond to, to, to cash on this opportunity. Of course, the naysayers are there globally. They will say Vietnam, this, that, whatever. But another very important point that was highlighted by, 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 by Mr. Sanjeev is the, the marriage of quality engineering and software skills in India. Uh, I would add one more component there, which is the accessibility to or the, uh, or the friendliness to the global language English really, uh, you know, puts us in a very, uh, uh, a very unique position today. And if we are the one in the China plus three strategy, we are the one, then we are bound to ben benefit from everywhere. And don't forget our own, you know, growing consumption and the way the economy is bouncing back. So the component industry will also benefit uh, sooner or later from that for, for, for our local manufacturers also. Uh, I have one question from, uh, I mean, I have lots of comments there, a peculiar question for a customer, for a, for a person on the panel, which I don't think we are here to discuss, but uh, there is a, a good question here, which uh, says that won't the to distributor sort out issues. I think this is a peculiar question for one of the panelists. So this won't be uh, good to, you know, get into. And somebody's commented that ISRO and DRDO, DRDO has proven it enough to the world to come out of their myth on Indian quality, which, which I think is a very, very interesting comment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anish Nair for that comment. So uh, I think that is very much in from um, what I see in the chat. And the, the two questions which I think, and somebody's appreciating Manu a lot, who seems to be batting about vendor partnerships. So you have a big fan following there, Manu, on the on the on the. Uh, participa Please participants. connect with me. <laughs> so I will. <laughs> so I think we've had a really, really good discussion so far, and we have some time left. Hmm. And, so Anil, uh, sorry, can I just uh, jump in? Anil? I will. I will. And, uh, okay. So uh, as a retort to your point about English speaking, you know, uh, it's a very valid point and very important. But the only thing is, it, it's how quickly can we take advantage of this? Because, you know, last, before this COVID time, people like NIT and all, they have gone and they've set up huge set, number of centers. In China, for the same three years, I would say, for us to actually take advantage of this window that we have. So we really need to up our game, all stakeholders, that if we really want to be India as competitive, we, we got to keep moving very fast. And secondly, on the nearshoring side, uh, you know, we are hoping that uh, the exports from India will build because we will have quality vendors. So imports should come down and exports should increase. And that will really, you know, contribute to the value chain. Thank you, Anil. Yeah, I agree. But Manu, uh, regarding English, I'll give you a personal, uh, uh, a personal experience. We were sourcing racking from a very big vendor in China. And of course, the sales setup was very well attuned to English. And, you know, all the queries was being were being answered. But once our, you know, uh, sourcing team went into China and they wanted to talk to the engineers as to why the, you know, steel component is less and how you are compensating for quality and all, there it came up. So China will catch up, the world catches up on, on, on English, but in our system, it's imbibed. And there is a contrary example also. Look at what's happened to outsourcing. Philippines is outrunning us because their dialect is better. Okay. Right? Correct. So having it imbibed in our education system, that cannot be beaten. You know, engineering 100%, terms. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You know, I, I'm I'm not an engineer myself, but I can understand most of the engineers on board. Uh, engineering terms. If your vendor 
vendors engineer can correlate to i think it makes uh, you know exchange of thoughts and orders much faster so i I'll, i'll come back to one question which i said earlier uh, and it is very interesting that today we are going beyond the tier 1 or tier 2 we are trying to go and see where is he actually sourcing his material from and how robust is his supply chain now this is a change which is happened post corona because now you want to go to two three levels deep and you know want to study there my question is that when you want to study there does your vendor have enough systems enough transparency enough visibility uh, 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 visibility softwares to let you do that or you still have to rely on what he's saying or you know multiple reports coming in from him every time so i can take so this does his his supply chain system is transparent or not yeah i can take this so i think the the observation also came from you yeah yeah i can take this one so first of all uh, as sanjay also mentioned it did started after the uh, tsunami where uh, most of the company started working on uh, because at the time the impact was good but i would say it was not sustained or taken forward in a very right way but definitely covid has opened up this one and uh, it is very clear that we need to have this one now the question is uh, three things i would say you know to what extent we can go and to what extent our suppliers having this one so i would say with the experience what we have been doing for last uh, uh, one year on this one uh, not all suppliers have this clarity when you start so uh, at the step one they don't know where uh, beyond certain things no so it has to be a long process so we are struggling there Uh, and of course we are trying to bring our uh, suppliers also into the game and then try to work along with them to establish this one so the big suppliers of course they have more uh, easier uh, infrastructure to get this one but uh, 70 80% of the suppliers who are medium to small uh, they don't have this capacity so it is uh, we um, in our case we are we are trying to work along with them to get this one the second one is uh, information is available okay now how it is Uh, documented in a system or a process no that is um, also i would say still uh, uh, missing we have we have identified within daimler some systems to do it because one is information second is where you put the information so that somebody can consume it correct uh, so it's not that we collect it in an excel sheet and keep it somewhere and no not able to do it so that is the second challenge we are trying to address at least from our point of view we have identified some global uh, 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 platform where we can document this one but we are just still checking whether it is going to meet our thing the third important point uh, is uh, from my point of view uh, it is not a one day exercise or one month exercise which we can finish correct it is going to be a long drawn process uh, where we say now we are complete uh, the question is are we going to be persistent enough to in this journey to finish this correct once covid is over once the uh, crisis is over are we going to forget this is exactly what happened uh, sometime back at least from my, my experience i can say so that's the challenge which we see because today we are in the need so we are putting additional resources or additional capacity to do it when things become normal we might need it that's a big challenge i see how persistent you are going to be in this mission to finish it up right? and this is not a one time exercise this has to go but at least uh, once you finish this loop you are at least 80 90% uh, 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 having the information Uh, and the last point as i mentioned is how are we going to consume this information correct as and when we get some smoke somewhere like we saw uh, uh, some some uh, problem in some countries no immediately we have to understand what does it mean to us correct by the time we see this because when i talk about tier 3 tier 4 the impact that we will see is after 6 to 8 weeks because of the value chain correct are we able to predict something we see some news no okay there is a power drop in china for one day no Uh, what is that impact is going to be we had this problem typically in the month of july august no ludhiana uh, in india punjab we had an impact of power for two three weeks no uh, by the time we came to know the impact it is only one week late so idea is how are we going to consume this data proactively and for that we need a, a, a digital solution i would say still long way to go there but that's defined and we need to come there that that will be my uh, comments on this one yeah thank you thank you very much Uh, dr sant can we have a comment on you uh, comment from you on this i i think it was very clearly muttu that we you mentioned that we are still away for that yes definitely 
and of course there are efforts which are happen into this thing suppose if you are supplying some to very typical government organization where your part approval is already there so what happen you have the data already i cannot change some of the electronics into which i am supplying to government because it is pre approved so i have the data but that data is in different different forms how i'll put it on the live is a issue which is being there and there what our observation is that you when you are able to do abc and critical analysis you will find that you have to do that for only probably 15% of the items uh, only and that gives you a starting point that okay these are the critical items these are the only 15% how i am going to do that and lot much digital information is available uh, say for example anything which is going to change if you are able to align or you are involved say for example i take example of government changes on bis bureau of indian standards so they have plan of what they are going to do for two years and if your person is their part of their quality team then you know okay now restrictions will come and then you are able to ask the time oh i six months are not sufficient i need one year so you are able to participate into such forums which will help you to have a planning and very clearly another thing a lot of information say for example there is a scm risk methods news which comes i come to know of something small road block into india through europe uh, on my desk every day that okay this is happening uh, when the question is whether it is relevant it is not relevant there you lead more skills then otherwise the information is not much available and my thing is that you need to look into all the government things when they are asking for opinion when they are going to form some policies to actively give them suggestions otherwise you will be always on the receiving end of the changes uh, this is what has happened and uh, multinational i mean devler benz is not exception uh, we have our counterpart in respective countries so we know and we are having this forums are increasing that you have a regional forums where every month people are able to tell okay this is my changing at uh, something uh, is happening Uh, these are the regulation changing this is a situation so i think all this thing put together we need a really focused approach to have such uh, changes to act on them quickly i don't say that it will be always possible but at least we should be doing effort uh, on that and they should be focused uh, somebody is really exclusively working on such a topics and coming back to you that okay oh my god this has happened uh, and uh, Uh, you remember we talked about the uh, su- uh, tsunami in japan but few years back there was a volcano issue which uh, affected all the flights from europe for a very long time so we have a very short memory of all the problems so we are not do- dealing with manu only with wuka but we are uh, dealing with wuka plus disruption absolutely sir absolutely and then on that disruption now you have black swan getting added into that so uh, you will have to uh, handle all these three things together <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and we when we we were talked about swiss canal even that we are not talking about today right so yeah. i'm just you know, when you talk about uh, you uh, we are still living moment to moment but uh, <laughs> promo sir you know i was in uh, in an interaction with one of the ceos of one of the companies i learned something from you know which i'll just relate to what you said there is a lot of information today but it's up to us as managers and leaders to convert that information into knowledge yeah. and if we don't convert that information to knowledge we will not get the benefit of whatever analytics we are doing so we should be able to absorb that information and translate it and also connect it to our business that's when it gets converted into knowledge so that's a huge learning and you're absolutely right sir right from you know google to there are so many other information for available but how we use that and apply that in our business every day is most important sir i just want to interject uh, to add a point here so very nicely said mr mono so the uh, the world economic forum brings out a data stating like world's uh, sub, uh, crisis in terms of your overall end to end will be uh, primarily determined by four major kind of events like more than 30 35% of disruptions uh, will be due to weather weather incidents and and a little bit of socio and political stuff but predominantly it's weather so the predictability the tools as you said there a lot of data but are we using the right data how smartly are we using the data right. i think that is where a lot of data is just gone to the gutters i mean uh, it's all an art of how you pick the right data to your dashboards 
every service provider or a tech partner comes with a lot of dashboards but how much of them actually results into a very solid visibility platform for any uh, oem or a supplier so so that's something which i think uh, the journey has begun um, every predictable uh, platform i mean we have been working with a lot of ocean tracking uh, uh, tech partners uh, in terms of how to develop it's it's again a partnership as you rightly said earlier it's about partnership because they have come with a point of view in terms of a developing a kind of a system but the more the inputs it comes that the tool gets really validated and becomes much more uh, robust uh, and uh, comprehensive so that's one bit of it and other one as muthu was mentioning uh, the tier 2 tier 3 uh, they are still uh, in, in at least in india right the, the the tech penetration is not much so again how well you have a lot of startups obviously so uh, i presume that in the coming years so those democratization of all those technology should enhance the end to end in terms of the uh, supplier systems right uh, sanjeev uh, thank you very much for your uh, input there but i think uh, mr muthu's point that let's not forget let's learn and keep learning and keep moving on this new paradigm of supply chain and uh, you know like uh, no good crisis goes waste or no bad crisis goes waste this crisis has actually put us in the forefront and to the point where we deserved actually you know we've been as supply chain managers as supply chain partners as supply chain vendors the pretty much the backbone of the economy and you know uh, uh, i have been now put up in charge of the cii image building committee and i think i don't have any job you know all the uh, uh, all the functions of a company which were you know completely highlighted all the time always in the highlight sales marketing and this and that suddenly for last two years have have realized that what it keeps it moving what 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 makes them achieve the end goal is the supply chain and i think more important the consumer has realized because you know uh, your food reaching every day your food products reaching you every day in the time of crisis how the vaccines moved right all this and to now which is uh, i mean i'm on the receiving end which is not getting any cards on the road you know because uh, there are no chips right suddenly everybody is talking about chips why they are talking about chips is that entire luxury segment uh, capacity or production in india is sold out right there's not a single car and uh, the, the 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 sales guys who used to say that you know we sell the cars and you know everything i i met ceo of a of a of a luxury car retailer i said why don't you go on a five month holiday because you your whatever your principal is producing it's already sold so i think uh, supply chain has uh, uh, sorry to say but the, but this crisis has brought supply chain to the forefront and what my take away from this entire uh, i mean if i was just to highlight the key takeaways is that one it's an, it's a great opportunity for india and india is moving ahead the naysayers will remain they will nitpick and they will you know say ye nahi ho raha hai wo nahi ho raha hai aise hota hai waise hota then let it be let the naysayers be let's do with what we can with where we are and whatever we have the good part is that uh, manus pitch on infrastructure i keep on uh, debating with him individually also is that the the trunk routes and the trunk infrastructure in the country has been laid or very shortly will be you know within the next 2 years will be achieving a completely different paradigm so it's really like you know and i, I don't need to get into 20 projects there are just two projects which i'd like to say which is the delhi mumbai road and the delhi mumbai freight uh, corridor right if all goes well they'll be com- well completed by 2023 end or earliest by 2024 right and these are the kind of trunk lines which will help us access the global markets much better and hopefully from you know a uh, uh, an export uh, deficit country we will move towards an equilibrium and there'll be uh, and then manu will manu smile will go a little less because equal number of containers moving out and moving in means there's no arbitrage left right 
but but that is the kind of uh, opportunity that lies in front of india today and uh, in terms of challenges dr sant had highlighted a very very important point that you know there will be always be challenges but if you break up your supply chain challenges into various buckets you can you know address them much faster so instead of just saying that if you source from x geography it takes so much time if you just ask yourself the question how i take so much time and where's the you know lead time which is causing the 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 choke point you can you know improve it much better and uh, thank you very much uh, muthu and sanjeev both for bringing out your experience onto the forefront and sharing what you have learned in your career scape although you know in one hour how much one and a half hour how much can we share but but i think it it was a very enlightening uh, conversation for me at least i don't know about the audience i hope it was as enlightening for them as it was for me and uh, with that i think uh, i would just say thank you to all gentlemen and close and if anybody has any any last lines to say please feel free we still have 3 minutes to go i'll just start uh, i first thank uh, cia and the team here uh, Uh, i think it went off very well a lot of uh, insights and the best thing is the commonality of the thoughts i think almost everyone were in convergence with the key uh, the, the key thought process um uh, and it's pretty much uh, appreciative that we we think of uh, india as a very positive market and uh, 